Hello everyone. Today we'll be talking about metabolic alkalosis and how to work up the differential and understand the pathophysiology behind some of them. In the previous lecture, we understood five physiological processes in metabolic alkalosis. Those were volume depletion stimulates your androstone production and this causes volume expansion, hypokalemia and metabolic alkalosis. The alkalosis is then maintained by hypokalemia as it causes intracellular acidosis which results in more hydrogen ion excretion and ammonia genesis and this also generates bicarb. We also understood that increasing sodium absorption in DCT and CD results in negative intraluminal charge therefore more efficient hydrogen and potassium loss. In DCT, there is a molecule called pendrin which helps secrete bicarb but its activity depends on the availability of chloride. I would suggest that you go ahead and watch the previous lecture for more detailed understanding. So whenever you deal with metabolic alkalosis, volume status is the most important. Try to figure out if they are hypervolumic or hypovolumic. Both of these conditions will be hypokalemic. Hypervolumic state is seen in primary increase in aldosterone such as primary hyperaldosteronism, hydrosteroids, excess ACTH, etc. Hypovolumic state stimulate aldosterone production so the aldosterone production is secondary and this would be seen in diuretic use, vomiting, laxative abuse, etc. These etiologies are also a very good differential for hypokalemia. And as you can see, your hypervolumic state will have better blood pressure while your hypovolumic state, you'll be having softer blood pressure. Urine chloride in hypervolumic state is high and in hypovolumic state is low. However, patients with diuretic use, water and Gettleman syndrome these patients have problem with the sodium and chloride channels, so they will be losing a lot of chloride in the urine. So these would be hypovolemic, but would have high urine chloride. So let's understand about aldosterone first. Any hypovolemia stimulates aldosterone production and aldosterone results in volume expansion by retaining salt and water. Consider alkalosis and hypokalemia to be side effect of hyperaldosteronism. The volume expansion correct hypovolemia your stimulation goes down and everything comes back to normal. There are other conditions in which you can have elevated aldosterone which are not stimulated by hypovolemia and these would include primary hyperaldosteronism, ACTS production, excess glucocorticoids, etc. In these cases, your aldosterone will still cause volume expansion by sodium and water retention, alkalosis and hypokalemia and this would result in higher blood pressure. In the previous lecture, we understood that aldosterone stimulates sodium channels, potassium channels, sodium potassium ATPs and hydrogen ATPs and this results in sodium absorption and potassium loss. Water follows sodium, you lose proton in the urine and thereby generate a bicarb and this results in hypertension, volume expansion, alkalosis and hypokalemia. In patients with aldosterone excess, since their volume expanded, sodium and chloride absorption in the PCT is not optimal. So large amount of sodium and chloride reaches collecting duct. Some of this sodium is absorbed in collecting duct due to your aldosterone stimulation, but still most of the sodium would be lost. Therefore, your urine would have high sodium, high potassium, high chloride. Your Fe urea will be more than 35% and your urine pH would be low. Whenever you think about aldosterone, think about your pituitary adrenal axis and renin angiotensin system. Pituitary makes ACTH which stimulate your adrenal cortex to generate glucocorticoids and your renin angiotensin system stimulates your adrenal cortex to produce aldosterone. Since cortisol structure is very similar to aldosterone, high dose of cortisol can work on aldosterone receptor and result in similar symptoms of hyperaldosteronism. So the differentials for increased aldosterone excess would be Kahn syndrome, ACTH production either ectopic or through pituitary adenoma, excess glucocorticoid such as in Cussing's syndrome or hydrosteroids, renin secreting tumors and renal artery stenosis can stimulate renin production and licorice ingestion. Licorice is used as sweetener and thirst quencher and is a very common bold question so know it well. Licorice inhibits your 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase 2 and this prevents inactivation of cortisol to cortisone. So increased cortisol level results in your relative mineral or corticoid excess and this results in hypertension, hypokalemia and all the other features of hyperaldosteronism. 
Everybody knows what causes hypovolemia, and there are only a few ways that you can lose fluid from your system. And these would include vomiting, diarrhea, through urine, sweating, and burns. You can also lose volume by bleeding out or from excessive drainage of secretions. Upper GI losses result in loss of chloride, hydrogen ions, and potassium, and result in hypovolemia. So patients with vomiting or nasogastric suction would develop alkalosis. Watch out for patients with anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa, which can have chronic alkalosis. It is important to remember the electrolyte constitution of your gastric acid, and you can see that there is excess of hydrogen and chloride along with increased potassium in the gastric juices as compared to plasma. Hypovolemia from vomiting also stimulates aldosterone and both of these cause hypokalemia and both of them can perpetuate alkalosis. Lower GI losses can sometimes lead to metabolic alkalosis as well. In the previous lecture, we understood that you actually lose bicarb in your stool. So this usually gives you non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. However, you can also lose potassium in your stool and you can become severely hypovolemic. And when this happens, you stimulate your retin angiotensin system and this results in aldosterone secretion. And this would stimulate your bicarb generation and retention in the kidneys. So the acid-based disturbance in lower GI losses depends upon amount of bicarb loss in stools versus gain of bicarb in kidneys. And this would depend upon the degree of hypovolemia. So patients with laxative abuse and villus adenoma who lose a lot of volume through stool can actually have metabolic alkalosis. Certain congenital disorders such as congenital chlorodiarrhea have defect in intestinal chloride bicarb exchange resulting in chloride loss and resulting metabolic alkalosis. So let's see how does urine looks like in a hypovolemic state. If you remember your sodium chloride and bicarb are easily filtered. And because of hypovolemia, most of these would be reabsorbed in your proximal convoluted tubule. So, a small amount of sodium and quite a bit of bicarb reaches your collecting duct. Since your aldosterone pathway is stimulated, you would absorb some of the sodium for potassium and you would lose some chloride. So, your urine would appear to be deficient in sodium and chloride while it will be have elevated potassium and bicarb. Your Fe urea will be less than 35% and your urine pH would be more than 7. Compare the urine electrolytes in primary hyperaldosteronism with hypovolemic state and you can see that the difference in the urine electrolytes comes from what is really arriving at your collecting duct. In both cases, you have aldosterone trying to work its way of absorbing sodium and losing potassium along with some hydrogen ion. Loop diuretics such as Lasix inhibit your sodium potassium 2 chloride channel and resulting sodium potassium and chloride loss. Similarly, thiazides in distal convoluted tubule inhibit sodium and chloride channels, resulting in sodium and chloride loss. When urine rich in sodium and chloride reaches your collecting duct, your aldosterone pathway has been already stimulated because of volume loss. This would result in some reabsorption of sodium and further loss of potassium. So your urine, sodium, potassium and chloride will be very high your Fe urea will be less than 35% and your urine pH would be less than 7. Patients with Kittleman syndrome and Barter syndrome have abnormal sodium chloride channel and these patients would appear as if they were taking diuretics. Hypercalcemia causes nausea and vomiting and some loss of hydrogen and chloride ion this way. However, the strongest effect of hypercalcemia is in your ascending loop of Enli where it inhibits your sodium potassium to chloride channel via calcium sensor receptor. And this results in a lot of sodium, potassium and chloride loss in the urine. It also inhibits aquaporin channels in your collecting duct, therefore worsening your volume depletion. And that's why you volume resuscitate patients with hypercalcemia because these guys are severely volume depleted on presentation. Patients with milk alkali syndrome or calcium alkali syndrome will have hypercalcemia and can result in metabolic alkalosis. Excess citrate as given in blood transfusions and TPN can also cause metabolic alkalosis. Citrate is metabolized to carbon dioxide and water which can form bicarb if there is inadequate ventilation. One unit of packed RBCs contains 3 grams of citrate and liver needs around 5 minutes to metabolize each unit. 
So if you give more than eight units of blood, you can end up with significant metabolic alkalosis. Other causes would be bicarbonate drips and bicarbonate pushes. So to work up a metabolic alkalosis, check the urine chloride. If their urine chloride is high, that means you're dealing with excessive aldosterone production without any reason, and that would consist of hydrosteroids, primary hyperaldosteronism, licorice ingestion, etc. This can also be present in your diuretic use because you have inhibited your sodium and chloride channels. Low urine chloride will be seen in hypovolemia of any cause, for example, vomiting, laxative abuse, etc. And as we discussed before, the reason why the urine chloride is low in these patients is because the amount of sodium reaching the collecting duct is low in these patients, while in patients with high urine chloride, this higher amount of sodium and chloride reaches the collecting duct. So patients with hypovolemia would be chloride responsive and patients with high urine chloride would not be chloride responsive. However, patients with diuretic use and Barter and Gettleman syndrome, these guys are also hypovolemic and they will respond very well to normal saline. Utility of urine pH is limited. However, you can see urine pH more than 7 in extra loss of chloride or acid. To summarize, when you're dealing with metabolic alkalosis, send a urine chloride to help you identify etiology. If your urine chloride is more than 20, you're possibly dealing with elevated aldosterone or glucocorticoids. Active use of loop or thiazide diuretics can also result in high urine chloride. Licorice abuse is one of the uncommon ones, but needs to be remembered. If your urine chloride is less than 20, you are dealing with hypovolemia, for example, GI losses such as vomiting, laxative abuse, hypercalcemia, etc. Other reasons include recent diuretic use. Patient receiving massive blood transfusion can get a lot of citrate, which is used in blood as preservative. In patients with high urine chloride, Look at your FE urea to differentiate primary hyperaldosteronism with diuretic use. Otherwise, looking at your history and your medical reconciliation should give you an etiology almost every time. Thank you.